Hello, and welcome to the induction video for the XRD and Raman Research Facilities. My name is Nick Reeves McLaren. I'm a research and teaching fellow here at the university. You can see my contact details on screen, and if you're trying to contact me on an XRD or Raman related uh, matter, I'd recommend that you email me at xrd at sheffield.ac.uk. My office is hidden within the I6 Research Lab. I have a number of responsibilities in addition to managing the XRD and Raman research facilities. I deliver lecture material to uh, both postgraduate and undergraduate students. I have my own small research group of final year project, masters and PhD students. And I also act as radiation protection supervisor and laser safety officer for material science and engineering. My office hours are restricted Mondays through Wednesdays and I work longer hours as a result Thursdays and Fridays. As you can see, I'm a busy person. Wherever possible, if you need to contact me, I recommend that you do it via email. If you do need to see me in person, then please check my diary before you come. There's a good chance I won't be in my office, and so I wouldn't want you to have a wasted trip. You can see my diary on the, la on the university website on Muse, and I keep it up to date. So please do check it out before you come to see me. In this short video, I'm gonna talk you through all the process processes that you need to complete in order to work in the X-ray or Raman research facilities. By this stage, you'll already have requested access. Probably your supervisors told you, you need to do X-ray diffraction or you need to do Raman spectroscopy, go and speak to Nick. And so I'll have directed you to complete this induction process and you're now watching this video as a result. The next step will be to complete all the safety training. The stuff that's mandated by the university and by law on x-ray and laser safety that you'll need to complete and there's also a generic risk assessment for the lab that you'll need to complete. Once you've done that you'll need to fill out the user registration Google form and that will give me all the information I need to figure out which machine is going to be best suited to your research. I'll then assign you to a machine and offer you training via email. The email will contain um, the location of the lab and the code for the door as well so watch out for that. All my machine training is offered between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. as a way of promoting workplace equality. So if you are an overseas student and it looks like I'm trying to offer you training at 6 o'clock in the morning please check your calendar settings and that you've got the right time zone set. Once you've had that machine training you should then be more or less ready to start work in the lab. Some of our machines may have additional risk assessments and if you need to do anything else I will point it out to you at the time of training. But once you've taken care of all the paperwork you're ready to go and so I'll set you up with an account on our online booking system and I'll then send you the URL for that and your username and password and then you're ready to go. In the rest of this video I'm really going to outline what I expect from users working within the facility. Firstly, safety. There will be some action required before you can start working in the lab, as I've suggested already. All the people working with XRD or Raman need to have up-to-date fire safety training. If your fire safety is not up-to-date, you won't be permitted to use any of the machines. There is a serious risk. We have had fires in the past with generators um, in the lab, and so this is something that you do need to take care of. You'll also need to pass whichever um, safety courses are necessary for the technique that you're using. So if you're working with x-rays, you'll need to work pass the radiation x-ray workers safety test. And if you're working with lasers, you'll need to pass the laser safety test. Don't worry about that too much. The next steps of the induction process will guide you through that and give you all the resources that you need and information that you need. Hopefully that you can then pass those tests first time. But do take a note of that information as you go through because those tests can be quite tricky. They're a lot harder than you'll expect. But all the information is there, so take a note of it as you go. I also have standard operating procedures for every piece of equipment in the lab. You can find these on the lab website on MOL. And if you see the screenshot at the bottom here, outlined in yellow is a section called the machines. Click on there and you'll find the SOPs for whatever machinery I'm offering you training in. You should download those operating procedures and read them before you receive your instrument training. Once you've trained, you should then bring them along with you when you're using the machine on your own. 
As I said, during induction, you'll also be prompted to read and sign a generic risk assessment for working in the facilities. This will cover you from most tasks, but as I said earlier, some instruments may pose further risks and have their own risk assessments that you need to complete. Also, for your samples, if your specimens pose specific hazards, you'll also need to complete your own risk assessment. So if your sample is biohazardous or toxic, carcinogenic, radioactive, for example, you'll need to complete your own risk assessment. But don't worry, on the lab website on MOL there, you'll also find information about filling out risk assessments and how to do that. All experimental work carried out in the facility must be covered according to the COSH regulations of 2002. That means any samples that are brought in must have a complete, uh, completed COSH form um, if you're going to be able to work with them in the lab. That COSH form doesn't need to have been approved, it just needs to have been submitted into the system. Some research supervisors will say that their students work is not appropriate for a COSH form and if your supervisor has told you that um, then you will need to fill out a risk assessment for your sample instead. Either way there needs to be some safety documentation for your specimens before you bring them into the facility. If you're a materials science and engineering student you can get support on COSH and risk assessments from Bev Lane, our departmental safety officer. If you're from outside materials then you'll need to contact your own departmental safety officer. When you're working with a machine collecting any experimental data, you'll need to place that safety documentation, the COSH form and or the risk assessment, into the document holder for the machine. So on the right here you can see one of our D5000 diffractometers and you can see on the right of that machine a sample safety document folder. And the machine is in operation when I took this photo and so you can see there are documents in that holder. Once your experiments are finished, you should attend promptly to remove your sample and take away your safety documentation as well. If you fail to display the necessary safety documents, I'll have to stop your experiment and treat your sample as hazardous waste and dispose of it accordingly to make sure you do have that documentation in place. You should work to the standards required by your own risk assessment and COSH forms, but I would say in the lab here, uh, no bare legs or feet, so you need to wear long trousers and sturdy shoes, no headphones, no trailing clothing. There is a risk in with some of our machines of getting hair, for example, caught in a machine, and so you should wear your hair tied back if that's a, a necessity for you. Also, it is a lab, so there's no food or drink allowed. That should be self-evident. I do try and make latex-free gloves available, but make sure you bring your own safety equipment if that is necessary, your own glasses or lab coat, for example. Any samples you bring into the facility must be clearly labelled in accordance, accordance with material science and engineering departmental guidelines, so they need to have your name, the date of preparation and the sample name or stoichiometry. Any pictorial or written hazard warnings should be there as well. Unlabeled sample bags are not acceptable. When you've run an experiment, as I said earlier, you must attend promptly at the end of your book time to take away your samples um, and also your safety documentation. Samples generally can be reused. If you are disposing of a sample, then you should follow whatever procedures are laid out in your cost form. I'm a big fan of lab cleanliness, so make sure that you clean up after yourself. I'm not a cleaner, it's not my job to clean up after you. If you do spill anything, um, you can use Blue Roll and there's isopropanol all around the lab to help you prevent or clean up spillages. Also, any specimen holders that you use, you should clean them out at the end of your experiments. Make sure you empty out any material and then give them a good clean. If something's proven particularly stubborn, there's an ultrasonic bath on the bench in I6 that can help you with that. Some of the procedures we carry out in the lab do involve using glass, glass slides and pipettes for example. Um, any sharp waste, any glass waste, must go in the glass bins. You can see those pictured on the right hand side here. Don't put general waste in these glass bins. I have to take it out and it poses a significant hazard to me. I'm always cutting my hands removing blue roll from these bins. So please, please don't put general waste in the glass bins. And don't put glass in the general waste bins. In the next section I'm going to talk through how you book machines in the lab. We have an uh, online booking system that's shared with other materials science and engineering facilities so it may well be if you've used other facilities you recognize this already if not I'll set you up with an account anyway once you've completed your machine training 
do be aware you can change your password on this system but staff can view your password very easily so don't use something that's sensitive or that you use elsewhere bookings on machines can generally be made up to 10 days in advance and the number of bookings allowed varies per machine I'd recommend you go onto the lab website on Mo and look under SRF user rules and responsibilities. You can see a full list and breakdown there of how much time you can book on each of our individual machines. It does vary a lot. Don't use any machine without first booking it online. Otherwise, someone else may come along and stop your, your session. Oh, and I will certainly stop it if I catch that. General rules for booking. You're not allowed to book more than two overnight slots in advance on any one machine. For some of our machines, for example the D5000 here, this limit has been reduced to one overnight session. So if I catch you booking excess time over and above what you're permitted, I will just cancel your sessions without warning. However, you can exceed these limitations if a machine is free on the day. I don't believe in having a machine sitting unused. And so if you find the machine is not booked, it's not in use, then you can, you're free to use it. But you must still book it online. If you're more than five minutes late, your booking will be cancelled and you must not book or use a machine under another user's name. Next, working practices. There's some legal requirements um, that we have to uh, comply with. It's a, a legal requirement that we log um, every time uh, an x-ray or laser shutter is opened. And so before you use any machine in the facility, you must complete the logbook. I'll go through that with you in the machine training. If you fail to do that, your time will be cancelled and your experiment stopped. Logbooks also contain service note sheets and you should use those if you notice any problems. Anything that not working right, anything, any error messages, anything at all that you're not happy with, you should note it down on the service notes page, even before you come to see me. Some other rules and responsibilities. Um, you must not use a machine in which you haven't been trained by me specifically and don't train other people in how to use any machine. You must understand the role and function of any safety mechanisms and not act to circumvent them. Uh, you must not alter the configuration of any machine. If you're doing x-ray work you should know how to use the radiological protection instruments or Geiger counters to check for radiation leakage and this might seem a bit odd but there are some wheelie chairs in the i6 lab by the analysis computers, please do not move those around. We've had ins instruments damaged where people have accidentally wheeled a chair into the front of a machine, so don't move the office chairs around. Once you've collected all your data, you'll then want to analyze it. And most of my training in data analysis is delivered online. So as you can see in the screencast here, I've outlined the data analysis section. Go in there and you'll find written instructions and screencasts where I talk through how to use all the different software packages that we use, or certainly most of them. Um, and so I don't offer one-to-one -one training on data analysis. Everything is found on Mole there. And finally, so just to summarize what you need to do next, once you've finished watching this video, you'll need to finish the induction. Um, so do your laser or x-ray safety training, make sure your fire safety training is up to date, read and sign the lab risk assessment forms, submit your user registration Google form. You should then receive um, uh, an invite for machine training within five working days. If you haven't heard back from me within that time, feel free to chase me up. Um, and then I'll point out at your machine training if there's any additional risk assessments that you need to take care of. Once that's all sorted out, you'll then be ready to go. And I hope that you enjoy working in the facility.